What I chose to put together today um, is uh, perhaps not all recent work. There are some reflections on um, some prior work. But on the occasion of, um, of putting a, a talk together, one always sorts work in different categories uh, to make it make sense because in, in our case, um, we work on small projects, tiny objects, to environmental scale projects, uh, urban projects. And uh, we work across media. Um, and it's very difficult sometimes to find the thread. Um, so what I did was I, I, I uh, elected to show some things that I feel um, uh, go together um, in a way that is, it re reflects on the way that we're thinking now and, and some of the uh, serious work that's going on in the studio. So um, I'm going to show work in, in, different, in different media, um, but most of it is related to the notion of the city as the platform today uh, for an architecture with a politic, um, a place of action, and um, the city uh, as a notion bypasses geopolitical stagnation. So collections of cities as opposed to nations or individuals. Um, and as the world becomes increasingly urban, the importance of bold local action um, is critically important. And we know that, especially with the environment. Um, so this talk begins with um, my urban consciousness, my personal urban consciousness. Um, and that is right here at Ground Zero in New York. 9-11. Um, Less than two weeks after the attack on the World Trade Center, New Yorkers were very shaken um, by this. Uh, I'm sure the whole world was, but New Yorkers more than anyone. Um, but there was this very strange desire on the part of the public to come to see the actual physical site. And at this time, um, the public was not uh, allowed within a, a mile of the site. It was very chaotic. It was filled with uh, the recovery effort, and then later, um, well, first, first uh, trying to find survivors, and then cleaning up. Um, and so there were many, many vehicles coming in and out of the site, uh, and many professionals coming in and out of the site. Um, and uh, the, the police really didn't want gawkers there, people that were just there to, to, to look. Um, but the question is, why did everyone want to be there? And um, at this time, you could not escape the images that were in the media. Um, every newspaper, you turn on the TV, everywhere, all around the world. Um, and, but there was this need for the physical... Um, um, presence somehow at that site. Um, at this time, the air was toxic. There was a smell of burning plastic, burning metal, uh, furniture, carpets. Everything was burning. And there was the smell of death everywhere. So this is, while you couldn't really see anything, you smelled the, the, uh, the ruin. Um, and nevertheless, um, this this kind of de the desire to see the spot to, was persistent. And I understood it in a very different way. Um, I couldn't actually, I didn't want to see the site. I actually couldn't look at the skyline for a full week after 9-11. Um, and then afterwards, I brought myself to look, and then I couldn't look away. And this was about seeing this absence. I, I you know, one could see, like the phantom limb, you know, when, uh, patients have an arm chopped off, they still feel like there's something there, and it's a very perverse thing. But anyway, I couldn't understand, but the, but the, but the public wanted to see it. Why? Is it a perverse love of the macabre? Uh, was it a kind of schadenfreude? Um, was it an empath uh, empathy? Um, or was this bearing witness some kind of uh, collective need to grieve? Um, so at this time, many professionals were summoned to action, and, um, and most were volunteers that were ready to help, like there were many doctors there, uh, there were chefs, there were um, firemen and rescue workers, social workers, shrinks, everybody. And as architects, and by the way, this is, this is well, this is what we saw in the media. Um, as architects, we felt a civic responsibility to somehow do something also to act immediately. And as professionals that deal with space, um, 
we asked ourselves, how could we solve this problem? Um, how could we admit the public to the site without getting in the way of the recovery effort? So while the city was totally disorganized and there was no bureaucracy to stop us, um, we uh, banded, a couple of architects banded together, uh, us, David Rockwell, and a couple of others, um, and we organized ourselves into a kind of SWAT team and we raised money, we got materials, and then we got a construction company um, to build this, which was this very long 100, 100 meter ramp um, from Fulton Street um, across, and it went up 13 feet uh, into a viewing platform. And when we did this, we just said to the city, somebody in the city, we, we really want to do this, we'll help solve the congestion problem. And this was very inexpensive, it was made of, sca uh, of scaffold and, and, uh, and plywood. And at the very end of the ramp, um, people could gather and um, they could see what was no longer there. There was a, some kind of comfort in seeing nothing. And for me, um, doing this and just taking action um, was kind of an important moment, I think, in the studio's uh, history. And the city was never the same for me again, and neither was architecture. And from this point on, there was a sense of shared vulnerability. I felt like a citizen of the city in a dangerous global context, um, and really as an architect um, in a different way. So our work in the city have, has been going on really close to 30 years, but it was really here that, that things just changed a bit. Um, so the fate of the city um, is critical, is of critical interest to our studio. Um, and more and more we see cities as the new front line of diplomacy rather than um, the heavier intractable nations. And at the same time, um, the city is a, is a place of, uh, to put a lot of um, energy, a lot of uh, creative energy. Um, as human populations are shifting to cities, many questions are raised about growth and the speed of growth and all the attendant pro uh, problems of infrastructure, housing, quality of life. Um, I wanted to show a, a project that looks closely at this population, population shifts. Um, and this is a project in another form. It's not exactly um, in bricks and mortar. Um, and it's, uh, it's based on, um, uh, on, on the fact that home isn't what it used to be. Um, and uh, we have to start to think of mobile, uh, mobile uh, um, groups and um, that everyone is in motion and typically the motion is toward the city. Um, the act of architectural intervention here comes um, from designing information uh, or data visualization. So, this is a, a new territory. Uh, we've always been interested in telling stories in different ways, and sometimes through maps, sometimes through forensics or tools that other, um, that other disciplines used, you know, from medicine and uh, different kinds of analysis. But here, um, we really wanted to take, to harness some digital strength and, um, and tell stories that could be palpable and emotive um, and, and, and have the effect of drama um, about this issue of people being uprooted from their homes, but without using uh, mm. conventional narrative media like film or photography or text. Um, and so this piece, it's an hour long, it's made of six stories, and it's about human migration for political, economic, and environmental reasons. And we did this in collaboration with Paul Virilio and Laura Kurgan and um, uh, Mark Hansen, and this was, um, and, and several programmers, very talented programmers and graphic artists and geographers, and we did it for the Fondation Cartier in Paris. Um, so the setup is basically a, a big globe in a, in a room that's, uh, that's circular, and so it's a big panorama with this as a, a video, and this globe goes around the room, and, um, and it's big. It's about, uh, let's say, uh, it's bigger than, than me. It's about se seven feet tall or something like that. And, um, and you could see that this globe has backwards land masses. So everything is backwards. And when the globe goes around, it takes 45 seconds, and it prints 
information. Um, it prints data, basically, or it erases data. And this is the beginning of the, at the very beginning. Um, oh, can we get the sound up? So at the very beginning, the, um, the globe rolls out pixels. Um, each pixel is 1,000 people. And all of, these, all of this information is basically gotten from 100 different databases. It's all geocoded. And then it's, um, it's taken through uh, some processing language. Um, and uh, all the land masses that you see here are, are basically, um, they're not, it's not designed. It's, it's, it's basically pixels migrating to points in space um, that have to do with the, this, uh, the data. So in a, in a sense, the project takes design, um, but it's kind of simply information, and it's not prejudiced in any way. So you can see the land masses are totally produced by these geocoded pixels. Um, and I'm going to show you some other little um, pieces of this, sh of this exhibition. Um, at this moment, so I'm taking little clips. At this moment, the, the globe rolls out um, uh, these, these lines, and then we start to see um, the decrease in population in various parts of the world and areas of increased population. So what, what this tells us, again, you know, just the land masses are formed by the, by the uh, data. Um, it shows that 48 of the world's fastest growing uh, 50 cities will be located in the developing world. Um, and so this, you know, more, all of this is data driven again. So this is about remittances. Remittances are basically um, the formal economic network that plays a very crucial role in the devel developing world. So something like 150, back when we started this research, 150 million migrants worldwide send money home in the form of remittances. And these transactions were typically in the amounts of 100, 200, and 300 dollars. So you can see here the erosion of these maps are actually, actually proportional to the remitting nations and, um, and where these migrants are. Um, the remittances added up to 300 billion um, at this time when we first started looking at this information, which is twice the amount of total global, global foreign aid. Um, so another portion has to do with um, uh, people that leave for political reasons. So when we think of mobility, we typically think of freedom. But sometimes it's a tragic necessity to move. And um, there are, people are forced out of where they want to live. Um, and sometimes they're simply blocked from moving. So this scene displays global movements of refugees and it, IDPs. Um, chronologically from 1991 and projecting forward. And one pixel here is one is, is 10 refugees. So these are refugees, asylum seekers, and so forth. Um, this is another piece. This is uh, on natural disasters. And this is um, basically the line that divides uh, global north and global south. It's the new equator which separates the developing world from the developed world. And um, this is a kind of socioeconomic and political division between wealth and poverty in a sense. And what we did here was we tracked weather events or some kind of disasters, natural disasters um, of the same magnitude. Like for example, um, here we're gonna, I'm gonna show a flood in two parts of the world. So here, um, a flood in two, two parts of the world. And you could see that um, w the event in Russia um, displaced 420 people. Same size event in India displaced 3 million people. And um, so you know, this says a lot about infrastructure and, um, and wealth. And um, it puts together certain kinds of information that are not normally seen together. 
Um, so there's a, there's a chapter here that we did on global emissions and carbon dioxide and um, global climate change, the sea level rise, um, you know, and we tracked 50 years forward. Um, we did uh, a, a chapter on desertification and deforestation and the loss of language and so forth. So I won't take you through all of that. I will just say that this um, way, this project, related geographical, economic, environmental, polit and political information. And these are normally seen in, you know, we see this stuff in the newspaper, we see it in isolation. And by bringing these things together, um, we're able to actually produce new information. And um, certain um, national and, and, and local policymakers um, commented that seeing the convergence of this um, actually framed situations in different ways. And, um, and this was somehow helpful to them to understand. So um, I, I show this project mostly because it's, you know, we, we do work across all platforms and uh, digital work is one thing. It doesn't necessarily mean digital to architecture, but um, we're interested in every tool that architects have at their disposal. Um, so go to, going to a totally other um, city, uh, an issue on cities. Um, this was a piece that I just, I have this kind of itch that I never scratched in Italy. Um, and this is about um, a project that we designed actually for the Venice Biennale a couple of Biennales ago. Um, and that we took to a very, very um, uh, far place, but we just in the end couldn't realize it. Um, but the city, um, as you can see, is uh, Venice, and it's got its own problems, uh, sinking and uh, antiquated sewage system. Um, so for the Biennale, and so this, that was the postcard you would send. This is the postcard you wouldn't send. Um, but um, we set out to convert um, Venice's photogenic, um, uh, but notoriously filth filthy canal water um, into the best espresso in Italy. And so this was um, the intention, and the installation was based on water pur a water purification system um, that basically sped up the cleansing effects of tidal wetlands the same way. Um, and the way it worked is that uh, basically a transparent glass pipe passing through a window at the Arsenale would draw water from the adjacent canal and propel it through a state-of-the-art purification system that filtered out first the sludge and the sewage and the toxins. And when the water was clean enough to drink, it fell, it fell um, like an IV drip in a hospital. Um, and then it got boiled into steam and forced through coffee grounds to become the quintessential Italian pick-me-up um, and served in the espresso bar in the center of the um, exhibition. Um, the project revealed uh, the tremendous resources required to sustain even our most quotidian comforts and called into question an implicit social contract. That is, when we turn on the faucet, we will always be safe, uh, the water will be always safe, clean, and drinkable. And this is something we take for granted, but actually it takes a lot to do this. Um, so with this project, tourists could drink Venice. Um, Unfortunately, the project was stopped. It went through all the um, levels of approvals, all the way up to the highest level of approvals. But on the way back down, it stopped because of uh, letting out a water contract um, too early before other, many companies were involved in bidding on the contracts. So it was a kind of political reason that it had to be stopped. Um, so I'm regret that we could never do that. But anyway, what's a great cup of coffee without a cigarette? Um, but yet, yeah, smoking has become a symbol of the conflict between individual freedom and collective responsibility in the city. This drinking glass uh, comes from an old project. It's the Vice Virtue Glass Series. And um, here we look at the ambivalence um, of our mutual hedonistic and health-oriented culture kind of plays in both worlds all the time. Um, but according to new regulations in most world cities, um, one, might, one may not have the right to be self-destructive uh, in a culture that um, shares healthcare costs. So increasing efforts to reduce smoking and secondhand smoke uh, in public spaces have created this new urban outlaw 
and the last spatial refuge for the lone smoker is in the no smoking establishment. And you know, it's it's getting um, and I'm you know I'm ambivalent about this topic, but it's just very interesting how um, you know the law begins to work and it goes across the world. And now there's a kind of empathy for these outlaws that have to be always, you know, into the, they have to go into the winter, into zero degree weather to take a smoke. But we decided that one way to um, rethink this is to make um, a no, no smoking um, zone, which is um, basically an a installation that was conceived for Amsterdam, and this is the logo. Um, so, so basically, um, it just brings out this notion of the, the smoker as in the conflicting status of being villain and victim at the same time. And these chimneys basically uh, would lift smoke uh, from the public sidewalk to above the street. And um, so here is one inside. And, and basically, um, the interface, there's a computer interface um, that would be activated by smoke, just the puff out, and there it is. And so when you um, exhale, basically you connect to the system and to basically a lot, the community of smokers out there, outside of establishments all over the city. So we were very interested in you know, putting subcultures together you know, through these different systems. Um, and so, the various sites. Now, moving into another kind of project, I just wanted to show this very quickly. Um, this is a, you know, a lot of our work um, is made out of materials that are not normal to, uh, to architecture, not physical materials. So, we do a lot of work with, with fog and smoke and dust and, and, all, and air. And, so this project was um, a super important project for us. Um, there's right here. So you're, we're looking at the National Mall. This is Washington, D.C., my nation's capital. And um, it's, a, it's a big city. A lot of things happen. It's the seat of power. There happens to be this museum of modern and contemporary art and wanted to expand and asked us um, on a temporary basis to find a way of utilizing the power of Washington for, um, for creative work, uh, contemporary work. And we decided that this would be a place um, that would be about um, um, cultural diplomacy, you know, something that we talk a lot about, but there's really, um, to, to create really a place, you know, where there is power, um, but specifically on this National Mall. And this is the place that represents the freedom of speech in America. Um, and uh, anyone can go there and protest. Um, but the mall is surrounded by these very um, stately stone buildings, and they're all um, uh, government buildings. And um, we thought that it doesn't really lend itself to contemporary, to a place for contemporary art and contemporary debate about cultural diplomacy. Um, so, um, and, and also, how do we take advantage of all of the intelligence around DC, all of the um, you know, think tanks and all of the embassies and all of the people that are visiting. So, so basically, this is the building. It's a Gordon Bunshaft building of 1974. And it's a donut with a big hole in the middle, and it's lifted up in the air. So the question, and it looks kind of like an FBI headquarters. But the question is, what material do we use? What, what's the language? And we decided it couldn't be a, a um, solid material, it had to be air. The project had to be made out of, out of air. So basically, um, we just, we uh, made an inflatable structure, which is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of as big as it needs to be, and it squeezes out of the sides, and uh, here it is where the, um, where the lounge is, and this is a cross section. And um, so it takes this, uh, uh, the spot of this void, and twice a year it gets brought out by truck, and uh, it gets unrolled and then inflated, and uh, then we can have this, this big forum uh, of an event, and, um, um, and then this space could be really uh, totally feel contemporary. Now, 
we had to explain this to the U.S. government, you know, how we can, uh, you know, like, why, why does it belong in the National Mall? And we explained that all of the domes around the, uh, the mall are like that, and this is just another dome. Anyway, but there were many interesting experiences with the U.S. government. Uh, when the, first, the question was, how long does it take to put up? And we said, well, the first time, uh, the first erection takes a week. And, uh, you know, the word erection in, uh, to American, um, you know, men with their ties, you know, and the work for the government, you know, was, that was very appealing, a one-week erection. So I think that we got... <laughs> We got a lot of support for it and for other reasons. And um, uh, the government had to uh, cut a lot of um, budgets from a lot of institutions. We didn't ultimately get the support, but this was um, basically the approved idea and hopefully someday we can execute this. And for us, it was inhaling the democratic air of of the, of the mall and was an expression of that. And so you know, the bubble is, uh, it was dubbed the bubble by the press. Um, it's an anti-monument and it, um, it, it captures the ideals of participat participatory democracy um, represented through suppleness rather than rigidity and that was very important. I'm moving to um, a project that um, we do, we're doing a lot of work in our own city which is very unusual that architects get to work in their own cities. They usually you work someplace else and then before you die they bring you back. But in our case, um, we uh, somehow hit the jackpot and we uh, were able to do a lot of work. But it was it's very interesting how in New York the notion, and actually not only in New York but all over the country and in other parts of the world, the notion of architecture as catalyst is really um, something that, that um, has woken everyone to architecture politicians and investors and so forth. So since Bilbao, um, the, the, the notion that a single building can produce this catalytic effect um, and produce urban change um, is, um, is pretty interesting and I think we're all somehow riding on this. Um, so the very first urban effect was when Lincoln Center was built um, in the early 60s. Uh, it was planned in the 50s. Um, it also was thought to bring all the arts together. It was sometimes unpopular that art would be ghettoized, but on the other hand, it was you know, visionary in a way to bring the opera and the ballet and the symphony and the theater and the schools and all of these all together in one place. Um, and what it did, kind of on the negative side, it was a part of an urban renewal project and uh, Robert Moses was able to remove many blocks, many businesses and homes. 10,000 people were displaced. And then the whole area started to evolve around Lincoln Center and became uh, more expensive. And, um, and, and there, so it's produced certain problem of kind of changing the demography, um, but in a very bad way, the demography for the actual cultural center um, it kind of produ it produced a very very bad effect where nobody came to Lincoln Center unless they had three hundred dollars for opera tickets. So um, part of the problem was that it was planned really to be a kind of mega mega block uh, that was built on a garage and a mechanical plant, and it was solid all the way around. And so what we um, did was we basically tried to correct some of the problems that were created um, a half a century ago by just breaking down the edges. And so these are, I don't have the before and after, but you could see here is the, this is the line of Juilliard. We, everything that we added, we actually kind of produced a, a transparent interface and a sieve where people could go back and forth, lots of public spaces, um, some of the interiors. The intention was to democratize the arts, and that was most fundamental to us. Um, one of the big changes, very simple, we took a road that was running here. So after you crossed 13 lanes of traffic to get there, you went across the street and then you, there were two more lanes of traffic to mow you down. So we pushed that road down, and we made this big stair, and kind of following up on the monu monumentality of the 60s uh, architecture, which by the way, uh, was the first um, 
kind of adventure into postmodernism. Um, Philip Johnson was involved in this. Um, and this was all based on the Campodolio. Um, but this was monumental, uh, kind of monumental on our own terms, this very thin bridge over a road that went underneath, and the steps are all electronic with um, information about what's happening inside. And then some more changes. Um, uh, this is a uh, kind of a grassy area with um, a restaurant, destination restaurant, and theaters underneath. And then um, just moving into, you know, just very quickly on another project, talk about Catalyst. So this is, um, this is our um, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. And the idea was that this, this whole area was industrial. And then it, when the in industry left, it just became all car parks. And so the ICA moved from the center of the city um, to this really wonderful site there right on the harbor. And it cost them $1, but the idea uh, was that it would start a kind of uh, development all the way around. So it was also acting as catalyst. And so um, here is the ICA. And, um, and we did a lot of exchanges with the city government for space where we um, sacrificed on our footprint and then we're able to overhang on city property, which is out here, 47 miles of uh, edge around the harbor, all around Boston. Um, that is a new initiative in Boston. Um, but then just some, um, these are just some uh, views of inside the space. And you know, this, this I'm most proud of this uh, part of the museum. It would basically, it's just the site and it's just reframed. Um, by um, often in our studio, we just uh, we try to use the least amount of stuff, and just by pointing sometimes or putting a frame on something, able to produce a very strong effect. So um, anyway, today the development is happening all around Boston, and it's no longer. Are we uh, long for those days when uh, there were these very um, beautiful? Uh, car parks, you know, that I, um, I, I, I miss very much. Okay, moving to another part of the world, Rio de Janeiro. Um, we are doing a museum of image, uh, the Museum of Image and Sound, which is a museum of the culture of Rio, and it's on Copacabana Beach. Um, basically, in the public imagination, Rio is a place of scenic beauty, hedonistic pleasures, unaffected by the socioeconomic realities of the everyday. That's at least the city we fantasize about. But the city has lost its glamour, and favelas are ring all uh, the city all the way around. And there's this, this super juxtaposition of the haves and have-nots. Um, but given Rio's diverse population and the difficulties it has in urbanization, the beach is Rio's um, great democratic site. It unifies the city. Um, it's a place of socializing around uh, natural resources, a place of display and spectacle from the single suntan body to events that draw millions of people. Um, the building is conceived um, as an extension of Avenida Atlantica, which is this well, uh, uh, Roberto Burley Marx uh, Boulevard. And you can see the graphics all, all across. And basically, um, we take this um, boulevard and we just fold it up to, to make the building. And, and, and so um, it brings the populations together of the, the people that are there to experience the museum and people that are just coming off the beach. If you're off the beach, you can take a shower and then you could, you could come up and go all the way up the building and to the top and have a drink. Um, watch a movie for free. Um, if, you're, um, if, if you're a visitor to the museum, you could come also in and out of that, um, uh, that, that surface, that thick interface uh, with, with the site, with the street. And this is an early sketch. Um, and then we wanted to also um, take the view, and this is thematic in a lot of our work, to somehow work with uh, the uh, visuality and the culture of vision. But to do something about this view, because most people don't have it, you have to have a condo on the beach or you have to um, uh, be a tourist in one of the hotels. 
But if you walk up this facade on the inside, you could treat the view as a, as a piece of, um, uh, you know, as, as something that the, mu that the museum actually has as one of their most valuable possessions and simply by curating the view. And so we're just um, kind of subdividing the view and dispensing it in small doses. And so here you can see um, this is a scale model, and, and basically this is blown up. Um, the entire facade is lined with these um, tubes that orient the view in different directions and cut it up in different ways as you walk up the facade. So um, that uh, context is somehow, it, our work is very site-specific, so it, it, it deals for, and this museum, I should say, um, is really a cool museum and has the Carmen Miranda collection of headdresses and shoes. So it's got a lot of in very interesting things. Anyway, so um, moving along, this is um, so these are some early views, and this building is in construction right now. Um, another uh, project that is in construction, and I start here, um, is is in Los Angeles. And um, I don't know if Spike Jones's movie Her was, uh, do, do you guys know? Okay. So um, this, this notion of the city, um, this kind of generic city, it's nondescript, is a kind of mashup of Los Angeles and, and Shanghai. And, um, and it's no coincidence that Los Angeles is, is part of this. Um, when I think about Los Angeles, I think about uh, Rainer Banham. It was some of the first readings I did about architecture. And Banham rejoices the uniqueness of uh, Los Angeles's car culture. He talks about a decentralized LA. It's unlike any other city on earth, and it's organized by regional geography and freeways. And uh, that's Banham. That, this is what he talks about. And um, in a way, when... Uh, we were asked to do a project there. Um, I had to really compute the uh, relationship that I have and my um, uh, uh, romantic relationship to LA with where LA really wants to be, which is a European city. And it's very strange. So, um, so this is um, right now, this is the site and it's downtown. And um, just a couple of things to know. This is from the 50s. It's um, another one of those urban renewal uh, projects where <clears throat> the city planners, um, to appease the, the business and political elites, basically just tore down everything and put up um, yeah, this kind of what they thought was a muscular downtown. Problem is that nobody's there. Um, you know, for, for many years, uh, nobody was there. Um, Gary's Disney Hall um, was supposed to be the silver bullet that would produce an instant uh, urbanization. And this was an expensive project. And it was, you know, it's a very beautiful project, but it didn't really quite um, have the kind of catalytic um, action. But since then, there are actually LA is on the move and um, urban subcultures are coming in uh, in different parts and artists are moving in and sort of, it's actually becoming more and more interesting. And maybe the building had some effect. Um, there are many monuments built all around here to help try and actually our project is, um, is, is, is part of this logic. Uh, but we had to really uh, kind of think how do, how do we merge um, kind of tendencies towards the new city with LA and what, what makes it um, tick. And so um, this, is, this is our site, this is Disney Hall. And um, so, I mean, the bigger problem, <laughs> forget about fixing the city, was how the hell do you put a building next to this, this building? And, um, um, you know, one thing is that, um, well, we, we could make it a, a relationship of differences where Disney Hall is shiny and metallic and ours could be matte, porous, um, and uh, you know, variegated. Um, this is the limit of our site. We could only build this high and uh, this high and this wide and two, two directions is the same. So it's a much smaller site and the program was much bigger than the site uh, could endure. So basically we could only do a box. It's everything that could fill into, into a box. Um, 
The, uh, another problem added to this was this is a collection of a single collector, a, sing a single idiosyncratic uh, collector, Eli Broad. And um, most of the uh, space would be for storage, for the archive. And so it's, it's a little bit more than half the space. So on this very prominent site that Los Angeles was trying to make into a pedestrian city and make more like a European city, um, half of it was storage. So what could we do? Um, so was it a museum and a warehouse? Was it a warehouse and a museum? And we decided to do something uh, like this. So we call it the, the vault and the veil. And the veil is, is basically the outside and the vault is where the art is housed. And um, this vault you see all the time. You see it from the outside, you see a big some kind of shadow uh, from the outside. You pass through it as you come off the street. You pass right through. Um, you, the vault is unpacked like a suitcase every time, and then it's repacked into the vault, and the vault also opens down here to more exhibition space. So the, we added actually more exhibition space. There's a little less storage. But basically, this is the idea. And so from the street, you come here. And then there's the circulation system that gets you up here, uh, the top of the vault. And the veil is a structure that spans about 70 meters in two directions uh, without any columns in between. And it's the way that natural light is filtered from all sides. And so this is um, one of the images that we made early without the side walls. And uh, the er very early idea is that you could drive into the lobby and um, you would have valet parking, um, but you know that they, we couldn't get away with this. Uh, this is where our romance about LA um, kind of ended because they really wanted you know, to be on their feet and, and, and we understood that. So anyway, uh, moving along, you come from the, uh, from the lobby up through the escalators to this very sublime space, one acre of art, and it's, I think, bigger than any other gallery, um, 40,000 square feet, 4,000 meters squared. Um, and it's all, all lit through these, um, uh, from, all, from different sides. Now, um, this is the diagram. You go straight up, and when you, when you finish seeing the show, you come down into this kind of entrails of the building, which allows you to see the collection behind the scenes. So you can see um, the conservation areas and the painting racks and so forth. So you see this idiosyncratic collection and collector. You're always reminded about that. We worked on this project in a CATIA, a digital project program. This is the joint between the facade and the roof. And so this is a 3D print. Um, everything was modeled. And the model is used for uh, fabrication and also for construction. Um, as well as design, this is just the, the units of the veil. So it ended up being, it first was um, intentionally structured as concrete, and then it became steel and concrete because of the seismic forces in Los Angeles. And so here are just some images of um, the production and um, mass production now of uh, these, these units that would be outside. This is now the ceiling. And um, these are also molded uh, pieces that go into the ceiling. The depth of the structure is exactly that. So these are the skylights um, that bring in the light. And so this project is well um, into construction. It will open soon. Um, and this is the view from the lobby. And you could see this is the stair that comes down the escalator up. And so you feel the heaviness of this space of uh, the basically a closet uh, for art. And then you emerge up into this kind of glorious space. And the, all the geometries converge here. Um, and there's a glass elevator. So escalator, glass elevator, and stair coming there. And up the elevator, and the elevator just the way it penetrates is just very, very transparent. And then coming up uh, or coming back down the stair. But when you go down the stair, um, it's really like the inside of the body, and um, you see you have various views out. So this is the archive, and you could see 
there are these moments where there's this uh, two-way vision. Okay, and then you come back out. And um, these are some images now from the veil that are being produced. So the first images were in a fashion magazine. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, we just uh, before we could even take any pictures. Um, so these are some images, and, and it's very interesting because we, you know, we designed this digitally and we were able to simulate uh, the light, make sure there was not a ray of sunlight that penetrated the space. Um, and actually the, uh, the product looks a lot like the simulations. Um, this is an area in the front of the facade, a kind of pucker that goes inside. And, um, and here you could see, this is the outside, this is the inside, there's a glass line. And so this is the glass line, which is there. And it will look like a, like a, like a bit of a lake that comes into um, the building. And here is more, are more construction photos looking around in the bottom, and this project is, um, will be opening in probably um, something like uh, uh, spring of next year. And, um, you know, just, just to fi uh, finish on this, the museum um, doesn't uh, pr uh, presume to fix LA's problems. Um, not, a building can't really do that, um, but it can contribute. Um, and in our case, we are playing with some of the logics um, of making this really transparent, all the corners are lifted. Um, you can see two ways. Museums are often um, a very isolated and you can't look out, or you can't look in, and we're you know, trying to really break down that heavy wall of the institution. And we're also, so we're working on a kind of building for a city that has a, a strong interface with the public, but at the same time, we're still very much believe in Bannum's plurality of form. Um, so the, the project is um, kind of conceived uh, two, two ways. And that coyness of, of vision is very, very important through uh, the kind of flirtatious building that allows you to see some things, but not everything. Um, OK, moving to Moscow. Um, very quickly, um, we, are, we won a competition to do a park here, Zaryadye Park, right next to the Kremlin. Couldn't be a more difficult site. Red Square is here, and San Basel's. Um, it is um, a former site of this hotel, Hotel Russia, which had something like 6,000 rooms in Soviet, uh, Soviet Union days. And it's now, it's cleared out, and we're making, you know, we're we're very committed to uh, the park as a, as a form, as a, as a very important um, uh, piece of the city. And it used to be that the city uh, was conceived as defense from the ravages of nature, um, a place to escape the hostility of uncontrollable weather, disease, and predators. But the success, successes of cities and their byproducts have tipped the ecological scale, the, very, the vast natural environment, which, were, which once seemed inexhaustible, now is very fragile. Moving forward, us global citizens uh, will prove to be a balancing act in which natural and artificial are no longer dualistically opposed, but rather partners intertwined in a dynamic and complex, complex exchange. And so we're adding to that this notion of wild urbanism, um, it uh, produces a kind of promiscuous mix of urban and wild conditions, and it's the first uh, in 50 years uh, in Moscow for a new park. Um, it incorporates four different climates and locations and uh, landscapes of Russia, um, the tundra, steppe, forest, and wetland, and kind of redistributes them on the site. And, um, and then it matches the actual um, uh, climate in those, in those locations, um, winter in summer and summer in winter. And so we're able to control the actual temperature and the feel of these spaces um, in a way to make these parks really used all year round and 24 seven. And um, the other thing is, okay, these are just some, some of the images. Um, and maybe just uh, the, this, this kind of gives you a good sense. Um, the, so these augmented climates, microclimates, are a very, very important part of this. Um, 
And it really kind of breaks the format of most parks, and there's no, there are no axes. It's actually pathless, so there's no, there's no path. It's only some hard paved areas that dissolve into green and you know, hard zones in different parts of the site. So you could see this kind of translation of the urban scape into this nat more natural space. Um, we like to flirt with uh, landscape and we like to make um, kind of a landscape perform in a way that, uh, that it, it uh, produces new effects. So here you can see maybe this um, installation of um, a landscape in Liverpool. Um, and so these trees, <laughs> these trees are planted on a bias. There are three of them, and uh, they move very, very slowly. Um, and they kiss each other sometimes. Uh, you know, the, the British population sometimes feels like maybe they're drunk or something like that, and you know, this can't really be happening. Anyway, but um, landscape is um, a medium that we treat, you know, with uh, all the respect of our architecture. And I wanted to <clears throat> talk about two more projects. I, I wanted to say something about the High Line because it is, we just opened phase three, which, um, so it's, it's been 10 years, and in three, since we started design, um, there have been three sections. So when you um, have a very, very long project that is basically the same, you can open it uh, like a, you know, basically cut it like a sausage, and depending on how much money you have, you can do the first part and then the second part and third part. So that's how the High Line basically has grown. Um, so, uh, you know, for those of you that don't know this project, it's basically an industrial um, railway, 30 feet in the air, um, and it was used on the west side of Manhattan um, in the meat packing district, and this is a really Interesting. Before there was a High Line, this train uh, was was basically on the gr on the surface, and um, there many pedestrians were killed. So there there was then a cowboy escort before the High Line, and then they decided that was not no way to really solve the problem. So then they built the rail 30 feet up. So um, this project is um, is I, I have to mention it's with Field Operations and Peter Udolf. So it's a it's a great team that was working on it. Basically, this is 1980 when uh, trucks took over the distribution of um, industrial goods, um, and no longer, you know, trains were no longer active. So since then, so this is what actually when we came up first time on the High Line, we took this video, and um, it was really a kind of wasteland. Nobody could enter. It was illegal to trespass up there. Um, and you know, there you just found uh, you know, needles from um, you know, basically you know, uh, people who were taking you know, drug users. There were condoms all over the place. There was like all sorts of throwaway stuff. I mean, it was really kind of interesting, illicit place. Um, but if we rewind the clock, um, it was these photographs that sold the New York City on doing the High Line, and it was Joel Sternfeld who was commissioned by um, actually Phyllis Lambert to photograph this, and these photos were then published. And, um, and it was interesting, the political power of photography really worked here because no one could understand that this could be that this could look like a park. I mean, it was just kind of amazing. And what was so interesting was that um, because this this railroad went in between buildings, and sometimes it was in areas that were totally open to the sun, sometimes um, exposed to the wind, sometimes in shady areas. Different things grew here. Um, so here there were trees that actually could grow, and the seeds basically came off the rail cars or were windblown. Anyway, it, this was what you saw from the street, so nobody could imagine how that ruin would have happened. And the way it was argued was um, using Central Park as an example. So when uh, Frederick Laurel Olmsted originally did Central Park, it was argued that the city would grow around the park. So first would be this beautiful park, then there would be a wall of buildings, and then there would be buildings around that would flourish from there. 
Um, and in fact, um, that happened. And now the buildings are getting oh, taller and taller. Anyway, um, this is um, some of, you know, we did a lot of research on the, on the different kind of species. There were, there were 100, over 100 species of different kind of grasses and um, basically weeds that were very interesting that grew there. Um, so how do you bring the public up without um, ruining this, um, this kind of weird ecology that kind of was self-seated and happened on its own? Well, we didn't want to do this. This was the bad way to do it, um, to have, it was very skinny, the High Line in, in, at, at various points. So to avoid this, we, uh, this was more the inspiration. It's, it's the way in this post-industrial site that decay you know, can, and rebirth can happen, and basically the way that culture uh, replaces nature, replaces culture, replaces nature, and that kind of cycle to us was really interesting, and we wanted to, to work with that. So we developed this, um, basically, the paving system. That's m mostly the project. Um, and it's, uh, we call it um, agritecture, and basically um, we were able to take 100% uh, green uh, landscape and 100%, you know, some places here um, that are hardscape and blend them together by combing together the pavers and the vegetation um, to bring anything from zero to 100% and any gradient in between um, by using these kinds of pavers. And so this is um, some of the construction and a view down from, uh, uh, from the hotel there. And you can see that the language is all very simple. It all uses the same language of the, of the paving system. So there's, we had to really think about you know, how much architecture, how much signature has to be there. And we realized that not much, it just, but a lot of design to be able to look like not much. Um, we also you know, took this uh, industrial rail and used it in a post-industrial way. And um, so these are just some views. These are, um, I'm gonna show just some, some um, uh, atmospheres. This is, by the way, where the five blocks of the High Line was cut by the previous mayor. And he also signed a court order to destroy the High Line as his last act. This is Mayor Giuliani. And the moment Bloomberg came, he uh, went back to court and basically he reversed the court order um, to, and now to save the High Line. So these are just some images, some taken from the internet. And you could see, you know, these, these vacant parking lots, this one is, is still there. But the, this is a Frank Gehry building. Um, it's a Jean Nouvel building over there. Um, so just with some very small effects of lighting, um, these spaces become really interesting at night. Um, so what we became, you know, what, it's one thing to design a project, but then what happens after you leave or when you have no control over the project? That's the best time, actually. So this is, you know, a couple of images here. This is a tenement building just off of the High Line on one side and uh, just at 20th Street, there was a construction light that was by accident that was hitting this building. Um, and uh, this person that lives behind this window happens to be a cabaret singer. And she would come out every night into this light, which was a construction light. She used it as a spotlight. And she attracted an audience and uh, it became called the Renegade Cabaret. And she became famous um, uh, from this. Um, but there are so many things that have happened that are beyond our control. Um, like for example, so this, is, uh, this building was actually zoned to be able to go across the High Line. It's the standard hotel. So it's just the only one building that could span across the High Line. Um, it's an all glass building. It was done by uh, Polshek. And the people that stay in the hotel now use it as a kind of way of exposing themselves to the people on the High Line. And, you know, we didn't really think of this, um, but it's, it's kind of interesting um, the way it happened. And <laughs> it seems to, you know, it's kind of unstoppable and the people that... <laughs> 
the people that, that uh, you know, there's a kind of agreement, you know, I guess cultural agreement that there's a captive audience and there are people that are exhibitionists and um, they rent rooms there. And so this unintended consequence is something that we had, you know, really no idea. And, and there were so many unintended things, like the way uh, Highline became a pop culture phenomenon. And this is, you know, I have to say, uh, the Family Guy is a, is a TV show, a cartoon in America, and this is like no better testament to the success of a piece of architecture than to be the establishing shot of a cartoon. So um, there we go, there's a the highline. And um, this is Marvel Comics, or uh, Daredevil Comics, one of those. And this is, you know, everywhere we look, there is a highline, it's kind of this Highline effect that we hear about after Bilbao effect, the Highline effect, and it's just very strange. Um, um, you know, here you can um, you know see more of this, and um, this is um, kind of interesting. We had no idea there are products that are being marketed. This is uh, Highline Bond Number no. Nine, the world's first railroad fragrance. Um, <laughs> it's advertised as the scent of wildflowers green grasses, and urban renewal. And so there is this kind of very strange industrial chic that is around the High Line and is one of, the, one of these kind of byproducts. Um, meanwhile, oh, and this is basically, we competed for Miss Meatpacking Meat District gown, and so we designed this dress. We actually won. Uh, there's just so many things happening around the, um, the High Line, and you know, some of them are cheesy. And, but anyway, we made this dress out of just fat, no mechanical connections. Architects, I think, um, can learn something from this. Um, anyway, but, uh, but one of the things um, that has happened is that this development that we predicted, and the Friends of the High Line predicted, um, which is the catalyst for a rejuvenation of that whole area, which why the city put in the money. Um, basically, this effect happened faster than anyone could predict. And you could see, you know, this, it says how a, how a park built on the junk heap became a glamorous symbol of everything uh, you love and hate about the new New York. And so this is something that, you know, at first we were the, um, the architects of the High Line, now we're the architects that are preventing, trying to protect the High Line from architecture. Um, and it's just kind of crazy. Um, you know, there are buildings being built all over the place and uh, a lot by star architects. And um, so it's a long way from here, you know, basically lube bags that we found on the High Line to, you know, and, and this, to this, $2, two billion dollars of development around the High Line. Um, who could have predict, uh, predicted this? And beyond that, this is uh, one of the early images that we made that in five years we would produce this, uh, basically this um, um, uh, biodiversity. We would bring it back because we had to clean out the High Line. It was toxic and then we regrew it. Um, but we're also growing a kind of urban uh, culture there. And this is, uh, you know, with different kinds of program. And it's something that when, you know, on, on the one hand, we want to imagine that the High Line could always be the same. But on the other hand, there is a kind of natural urban uh, ecology that happens. And what's also happened is that there are High Lines that are starting to proliferate all over the world. And the last... Uh, we counted there are something like 36 high lines. You know, we're just, these are just, um, and, and what's so interesting about this is that um, Promenade Planté in Paris preceded us. But this is, ours is the model for all of these new, um, uh, these new um, whatever initiatives in all these cities all over the world um, to rethink urban infrastructure and, and make it into like a post-industrial kind of not, not, uh, concept. Um, we've been thinking a lot about what makes the High Line so successful and, and especially to New Yorkers. I mean, this is where it kind of um, started. And we think we um, kind of reinvented something that, um, that is very foreign in a way to New York and then we brought back. And this, this little area um, that and when I go back this area that is built, it's basically, this was the configuration of the High Line. This is a little spur 
Um, and what we did was we just cut out, we just cut out the steel and we made a kind of seating area with, and we cut the steel here and made glass so that you could basically um, sit there and look at the cars just moving north and you could look at the taillights. And um, we realized that, that um, because you can't do anything on the High Line, you can't play ball, you can't bring a bike, uh, you can't do rollerblades, you know, you just can't do anything. You can only, st you can only sit or walk. And basically, um, this introduced the notion of doing nothing to New Yorkers because New Yorkers are always very productive. Like people in most cities, you basically, you're in the gym burning calories or you're working or you're on your device in the street. Um, and basically you're always doing something, but in the high, high line you can't do anything. So um, this is the epitome of doing nothing, is sitting here and just watching cars. It's like urban zen. And this is one of the most popular spots on the High Line. So uh, somehow um, urban parks are typically an escape from the city. Um, you basically you go to the to the High Line to re-enter the city, so to see it in a different way. You're entering the city's unconscious, the imperfect, the overlooked the blank party walls, the insides of buildings, loading docks, chop shops, uh, at arm's distance from cars parked on mechanical lifts in the air, um, next to fire escapes and smokestacks, floating at the height of uh, giant underwear ads. And even as the condos are going up all around, um, the Highland will always refuse to fit neatly into the logics of the city. And so this accidental ecosystem we found when we came to the High Line, where all these weeds were growing, and um, you know, this this found object has spawned a new ecosystem in which natives and tourists and artists and executives and socialites, club kids, cruisers, retirees, sunbathers, fitness buffs, fashionistas, and even flashers produce this new biodiversity, which is pure New York, which in, includes. Um, a lot of more and more people all the time. Um, it's impossible to reproduce the High Line. Um, the magic is that it's really, there's so much unintended there. And we just adjusted it. We pride ourselves in not having screwed it up, basically. It was already there. Um, well, I can't uh, imagine um, uh, remaking the High Line, but the fact that, that urban leaders are trying to reuse infrastructure is really great, and we really feel like we've, you know, we've contributed something here. Um, but then you know, we also think, was this catalyst that was intended to be a catalyst and was sold as a catalyst, has it happened too quickly? So right now, vestiges of um, industry are um, bordering the High Line, and there are also these glass condos are shooting up like blades of grass all around. And we worry that ultimately the High Line will fall victim to its own success and will have the homogenizing effects of urban development. And right now, the High Line remains this micro, microcosm of the city in this delicate balance. We're going to, and this is, we're doing a, uh, an opera called the Mile Long Opera on the High Line, in relationship to the High Line. And it's all about a kind of epic idea of this nostalgia for an irreversible past, or an irretrievable past, and the apprehension of a potentially alienating future. Um, so these are both, this is a kind of moment of gentrification and vacancy, and um, it's this kind of moment of the in-between, in-between lots of different things. So. Um, here we are, um, this is actually this photo was taken before the last section opened, so this is two thirds uh, from a helicopter. And even though it's like Zeno's paradox, it's almost finished, it's not really quite finished, another couple of years uh, to, f to finally finish it. Um, I'm gonna show one project very quickly, I know everyone wants to leave, oh my God, we have to eat and drink, uh, but I have to show this last project because this is my, ultimately my passion now. 
and that is at the very top of the High Line in this site right here. So um, in 2008, New York City put out an RFP uh, for a site 21,000 square feet. And basically, this is the site, this is the High Line as it comes up and goes around Hudson Yards, where the train yards are. It's the last undeveloped area of uh, Manhattan, and there's going to be a big development there eventually. Um, it's starting to go up. And this one area was reserved for culture right here. And um, the city asked, anybody have any ideas for um, a cultural institution that wants to expand or a new cultural institution? It was 2008. The economy was starting to fall very rapidly. Nobody had any ideas. We put one forward, and um, that's what I'm going to present. And I think we were the only ones that actually had an idea. We worked uh, also with David Rockwell on this project. And the idea is this. New York has 1,200 cultural institutions, but there is not a single one that is multidisciplinary. We work in silos. The artists are over here. Performing arts are over there. Creative industry is over there. Um, what if we put them all together in multi, truly purpose-built multidisciplinary space? Um, there is no space that's transformable, that could be inside or outside, that could be big or small. Um, and there's no place that's unbranded. That is, you know, we have the, the, the Metropolitan Museum, MoMA, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, but there's no place that's truly generic and unbranded. And so um, our model was Fun Palace, and actually it was like the last time that really, that, well, this was a separate process project in the 60s. It was not realized, but it was um, really an important piece of architecture, and it became realized, I think, in many... Uh, minds of it was constructed in the imagination of many generations that came after Price, and um, it's basically the building as infrastructure. And um, so these are some of his drawings. The one thing that we added to some of that was also self-sustainability. That cultural institutions in America are not supported by the state; uh, they're usually private philanthropy, and those philanthropy, th philanthropy dollars are drying up with a uh, downward market. So how do we um, make an institution that can pay for itself, that could be financially self-sustainable or largely self-sustainable? Um, and this is the way it happens, that basically you intersect cultural programming with in income-generating events and um, and they're all related to creative industry. So design, fashion, um, uh, concerts, art fairs, this, all of this kind of stuff that's the in-between. This is the, um, and so this is a, a moment where architects come to the city with an economic idea and, a, and a, a building idea and a programming idea and the city says, huh, that's interesting, um, you know, and so we were allowed to start working on this. Um, we got some support from, um, uh, on a grant and we were working for three years until the city totally embraced the project. And, um, and today the project is happening, but it's no longer part of the city. Now it's an independent, um, not-for-profit. So this is the Hudson Rail Yards. It, it takes place right there. And um, so looking at the High Line, it's right there. The new Whitney is going to be at the southern end of the High Line. And this is the principle. It's basically... Um, this is on the uh, level of the High Line, 30 feet in the air. Um, there's a plaza to this side of us, open space to this side, open space to this side. There's a building, basically our base building, with three levels of uh, galleries, museum quality galleries, and one open space on top, and a shed, a moving structure that telescopes um, and it moves on to, basically, it uses gantry crane technology. And when it, when it opens, it doubles the footprint of the site. So um, this is an early animation. You could see the building coming out. It docks into um, a residential tower next to it. And all the walls can come up. And uh, you can have something like 10,000 meters squared, continuous footprint. Very, very tall space. Um, all the walls open up, so um, you can have uh, open air events, but you can also close the walls. And in the winter, it's perfectly uh, great to have a show 
or concert or whatever you wanted to have there. Um, so this is a typical gallery. This is also, galleries can transform. This is now the shed itself. And the top of the shed, the truss structure here is basically a walkable theatrical grid. Um, and the walls are ETFE pillows. And this is the top, this is the theatrical grid. So you can mount any show there and you can change um, uh, anything in, a, in, it's very flexible. Usually flexibility is death. Here flexibility is, is basically the life of this institution into the future because it's basically dumb. It's not, you know, it doesn't use a lot of technologies. Um, so, so very, very simple. It's all modeled on uh, CATIA software, uh, mechanical system and structural system back to back. Um, this is, so it sits on six wheels and uh, basically the whole weight of the building is on these six points and um, you can stage really anything there. These are the different types of program configurations. Um, so most of the time, half of the time it's like this and then the other half of the time is all these variations and this is fashion week for example when the whole uh, space is taken. And we're working with you know some fabulous people also still from the city also Dan Doktoroff and, and people that were uh, very important uh, leaders in the city that are now have this new um, this 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 new uh, private institu uh, or institution where it's raising money to to do this and we are um, I'm going to just show you this very last animation and um, um, so there is a board now and uh, we're already starting construction actually on the foundation. Um, so this is the High Line. There are trains, the history of trains and mobility. This is the base building, and it's built into this tower, which has our offices and some of our back of house and our mechanical systems. And so it takes five minutes to open it. And here you can see trucks coming in into the loading dock. We have a conventional loading dock with a huge elevator. But also, the street on the, on the north goes up. And you could also drive a truck up um, into the structure and you can unload right onto the plaza. And you could also um, open the walls and you can load uh, from the side walls. And um, you know, I'll just have this playing in the background. Um, one of the things um, that we found that instead of having this top heavy structure of the museum uh, or a cultural institution like Lincoln Center, Culture Shed offers scalability and agility to adapt to very intricate programming of all different types. Um, and it's really conceived for an unknowable future. Um, and this. Um, you know, this is some of the folks in the studio wanting to make something big, but you know, in fact, it can hold 400 tons, so it can hold something like 200 cars from from there. But you could see that um, you can make different kinds of spaces, um, theatrical spaces, and you could um, basically uh, ma make it dark for for film, and it has good acoustics. And so, you know, it's, it, I have to scratch my head because we, we brought this to the city. Um, and we, oh, this is Fashion Week. Uh, so they can really optimize all the spaces. But the, the idea here, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, you know, the, the idea, and just to say one, one couple of words as this closes out, that um, it's really about cultural entrepreneurship, that it's possible for architects to be entrepreneurs and to be able to put I good ideas together to um, bring them to, you know, hopefully um, a progressive 
leaders to be able to find um, collaborators around and to be able to um, you know, f uh, make new things, to make new programs. And we don't always have to just receive things um, that are inherited. We can some sometimes make them up and make them happen. And so we will open, um, I have to say, I'm gonna uh, quote um, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who when he saw this, he said, oh, th this is an institution in a permanent state of surprise. So this is something I like to kind of um, explain you know, when, when I show this. Anyway, Culture Shed will open in 2018. Thank you.